Okay, we're live. Welcome to another edition of Chariots uh, Tech Chat Tuesdays. Uh, we are here with a special pre Philly Emerging Tech Edition interviewing two of our speakers. Um, so, um, first of all, before we do that, let's talk briefly, do a little housekeeping. Uh, in our blog, um, I'm actually going to share my screen here. Okay, that will do. Good. Okay, so uh, over here on our blog, we have two new articles that might be of interest to you. Uh, that's at chariotsolutions.com slash blog. Um, if you haven't visited it, there's a lot of practical information here. Uh, we've been doing kind of a, a lot of things on, you know, cloud centered stuff lately. So there's a fair amount of like, you know, data lakes and data engineering, Avro, stuff like that. Um, there's also some, uh, a little bit on, um, you know, some IOT and such, but recently we have two articles. So one is one that I put out there on AWS code build and flyway database migrations, giving kind of a practical view on how to, you know, keep your data up to date using flyway and running within AWS code build. Uh, and then we also have, um, some information on redshift, uh, about, uh, unbalanced data, how it can affect your query performance from Keith Gregory. So that's at chariotsolutions.com slash blog. If you head over to Chariot uh, on YouTube, so it's youtube.com slash Chariot Solutions, you can find all of our videos. Um, and so, for example, we've got various shows. If you go to the playlists, um, we've got, you know, Philly ETE 2022, 2021, going all the way back. Um, we also have our um, podcast itself, which is in here somewhere. Um, and uh, I can't find it, but that's typical. <laughs> But anyway, so, so you can find our archives. You can also hit that at chariotsolutions.com slash techcast. Uh, anyway, so you can find all the, the videos that we have from prior years of ETE, get a feel for it for our conference, Philly Emerging Tech, and uh, you know watch the ones for this year when we put those up on live as well. Okay, so um, speaking of Philly Emerging Tech, uh, we still have a few tickets to the show. So if you go to phillyemergingtech.com, uh, you'll see that uh, we've got um, a nice full roster of speakers, including uh, Yehuda, uh, who's speaking first with me today. Uh, we also have uh, two types of tickets right now. So there is a live ticket for in-person, and that one uh, currently, uh, there's a limited number of these left. So you'll wanna go ahead and grab that. That's at $525, which is, I think is a great value. We are uh, at the University City Science Center down on Market Street in Philadelphia. Uh, and that'll be great. It's the first in-person Philly Emerging Tech we've had since the pandemic. So we're all looking forward to getting together there. But we also realize that some people can't do this online. So I'm sorry, in person. So we've created an online feed, live feed of the show, both tracks running at the same time. And that is currently $150, which is a steal. So if you're able to, you know, watch even two thirds of that uh, at the time, it's really worth it. Um, also, if you use the offer code 25 off two five O F F, you'll save $25 on the $150 ticket price for that streaming ticket option. Uh, in-person tickets are available till they're sold out, which is soon. Uh, so get yours now, if you're still looking to come down and see us in person or April 3rd is the deadline for that. And online, you can go up to April 8th before we stop the, the tap on that one. All right, so this is a special ETE 2023 Meet the Speakers Edition show. And our first two ETE interviews today are with Yehuda Katz, author of Starbeam JS, and Russ Danner, VP of Products for Crafter CMS. So let's go ahead and bring on Yehuda. Hey, Yehuda, how you doing? I am doing great. All right, so let me introduce you. Um, so you're uh, speaking about Starbeam JS at our conference uh, and uh, You've been a speaker since at least 2010. That's as far as I could go back when I was doing search. I think it has to be or more than that, but probably is like 08 or 09, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, that's as far back as our, our archives went. Um, you, you've uh, eclipsed our index. I'd have to go actually to the Wayback Machine. <laughs> but uh, thank you for coming back again. We really appreciate it. Now you've worked deeply on backend systems with Rails. Um, you know, developing Rails and stuff before that, I believe, as well. You've done front-end work, starting with jQuery, building Ember.js, uh, and now uh, you're an author of this tool, Starbeam.js, which you're speaking about at the conference. So let's let's talk a little bit about, like, some of your background. So when you first got started, you were more into back-end engineering because there was no JavaScript front-end engineering of any ilk at the time, but you were doing... Um, 
uh, work on Rails. How did you get involved with the Rails framework? Weren't you working on Merb or something like that before that? Yeah, I think I need to make a small correction there. Mm. Uh, I think like an important thing about my personal background is that I'm always like at all times since I started programming have been working on the front end and back end at the same time with different emphases. Right. Um, the first open source I really ever did was actually jQuery. So there wasn't front end oh. engineering, but jQuery existed. Yeah. And like I started programming for real in 2005. Like before that, I maybe like knew like QBasic or something. Um, but I started programming for real in 2005 and uh, I was looking for open source stuff to do. And the answer to your question is <laughs> gonna come through here. Um, Jake, I, jQuery had no docs basically, but there was a wiki at the time and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I asked John Rezig who made jQuery like, hey, can I help you with docs? And I said something like, it seems like there ought to be a way to like generate something. I didn't really know anything I, at the time I was a new programmer that I could use to generate the docs or something like this. Mm -hmm. And he gave me an XML dump of the whatever happened at the time. And I learned XSLT because I didn't know how to make a server at the time, like at all. And I so I just like made an Internet Explorer XLT transformation that converted the XML dump into a like an interactive, like you could click around. It was like based on a poster that someone had made. Um, and like in retrospect, that's pretty weird. But I think part of what it made me realize is I don't really know how to do the back end at all. Like that's not good. <laughs> um, and I had a job at that time doing like basically all of the websites for a nonprofit, a large nonprofit in Brooklyn. And I went to a class about prototype JS. And that the guy who happened to run that class was Thomas Fuchs, who happened to be the creator of prototype JS. And he was like, by the way, you check out Ruby on Rails. It's good. At the time I was trying to learn PHP, I was succeeding at it, but it was it's not good for like it's fine, but it's not you're not gonna make a CMS with PHP on yeah, at right. that point in my career. And what was like really cool about Rails at that point was that at that point in my career, when I barely knew anything, um, I was able to like be like, okay, uh, like nonprofit that I work at, we're gonna like I have an, a plan for redoing our whole website and like making it into a CMS that you can you can edit. When I like had maybe one year of programming experience, and I so so that's how I got into Rails. What ended up then I got a job working um, on a real Rails app. Uh, it still exists called Procore. And at some point in that process, I became a little disillusioned with Rails because it was it wasn't um, it was so in unmodular that thing like we had a very significant we sent a lot of emails. So it's it's Procore is basically a thing that helps um, contractors work with the people who are uh, people's houses that they're building and communicate mm -hmm. and like do it in a way that was better than fax machines, right? But we like still have to support fax machines and emails and whatever. And so we ended up doing like wanting to use things like Rails's mailing service in weird ways that Rails didn't think of. Mm -hmm. And I also like at that point got into like I had to build like a, a service written in Ruby for Windows 2000 for the enterprise, whatever kind of thing, because that's like the kind of people that were the customers of that product. Right. So. Mm -hmm. So basically, I got the, by the time I was I ended that uh, I got recruited by Engine Yard, which I was maintaining Merb at the time, and was also the main like they before Heroku, Engine Yard was like the company that big companies went to to deploy their Rails apps, and so they recruited me to like come work there, and I, and basically at that point I was like I had already started getting into Merb because I was unhappy with how unmodular Rails was. And like to some extent performance, but a bigger concern was we're trying to use the mailer in a way that's not intended. And it's like impossible. I have to fork the whole thing. Right. So right. basically, so that's the answer to like, basically I got that. I worked on Merp for a while. I like was a young whippersnapper, like sniping <laughs> at the rails people from the sidelines. And mm -hmm. eventually like between some arm twisting at engine yard who like made its money from rails. And, um, but also like general, like DHH being willing to go along and, Generally, I'm like a reconciler kind of personality at the end of the day. Like we basically got, we sat down and we said, okay, what's really the difference in the end between these things? And I think enough time has gone by. I'll, I'll, like what I personally think the difference is, is DHH is just not that interested in the implementation details or making, like he, he doesn't get, he doesn't stay up at night thinking about how to make the internal implementation details more elegant. Mm -hmm. 
stays up at night thinking about how to make the ergonomics of the of the um, user experience more elegant. And my perspective back then, and it continues to be true to this day, is that there's no actual you can't draw a line between those two things. If you if you fail to make the internals of a system um, well factored and composed, then the thing that happened to me, which is I'm trying to use your mailer system, which is very nice for the specific for Basecamp, the case you thought of. Uh, suddenly, it's not very elegant at all, and there's nothing to do about it, right? So, the idea of like what we need to do is make it a layered approach where the we can continue to maintain the ergonomics that DHH likes, and I think that's the difference between me and most other people who do this kind of thing is that because I came up through these very ergonomic systems, and my perspective about the internals wasn't like a fascination or a, ultimately a desire to make the internals better, like on its own. It mm -hmm. was more like, I really care about the internals being good so that the experience for end developers is good. I wasn't willing to sacrifice the front end, that the, the, the ergonomics, right? That was, yeah, right. That was still like very core to what I wanted. And I would have considered a massive failure if the process of modularizing Rails resulted in worse experience. And in fact, nobody thinks that. Everyone who was around back then thinks it resulted in a much better experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. like inventing Bundler, like the first application package manager, right? So I think basically mm -hmm. that, so that's basically where I came up through. And then well, I'll let you ask more questions. Yeah. <laughs> I think basically what, and like I eventually got done with Rails 3 in the sense that like the project that I started with, like redoing the internal so they were more modular got done. And then I like took a look around and this is a good jumping off point for other questions is like, okay, the front end is still kind of a wasteland in 2009. And like maybe putting some energy into there would be a good idea. And that's kind of where Ember, no, this is like more like 2010. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so right. Exactly. So I was kind of like going through just from the, you know, speaker uh, series perspective. Right. So at 2010 ish time, we were doing some talks about like where rails three was and web three Oh yeah. at the time, which you were really early on the word three Oh, but I think everyone's been looking for what's after web two. So currently it's like, you know, get rich, get rich quick, uh, <laughs> math quants. Um, but, but you know, it's, you were trying to find a way to like truly treat as like client server. Like you've got a, a desktop app running in a browser. You have the ability to cache things. This, you know, HTML5 at the time, HTML5 manifest were coming out before the PWA really kind of like made that a real standard, at least where it is today. But so it seems like you, you, you worked a fair amount on the web at that time. I've always been a true believer in the web, like not again, not from a ideological perspective, although I care about that, but like yeah. from a, I really think at the end of the day, the fact that the web is on every device and, yep. and that continues to be more and more true over time means that if you're tr like, and it ultimately converges on having all the capabilities that like anybody wants eventually, like there's just no reason not to believe that the web is the right place to think about building stuff. For sure, for sure. How it is. So, 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 you know, you got you got to a certain point with jQuery and 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 Rails where you know you certainly could do the AJAX back and forth and make a page active and replace chunks of the page and activate different things and have interactivity, even building kind of your own informal front end to a back end. But you ended up building your own single page app framework. Let's talk about the origins of Ember JS. So, how did you first of all? How did you make the leap and say, I'm going to build another framework and do it for the front end? Like, what were your, what was your reasoning for that at the time? So there were two pieces of that. I think, first of all, at the time, Mustache.js was the only templating engine. I and that. I looked at Mustache.js and the fact that it was like a pretty declarative system. And I was like, you know, I have a theory that you could, like this, infer the fact that it's so declarative is enough to make it reactive. I didn't know the word reactive, but like yeah. automatically updating. But I then I looked closer at Mustache and like, for one thing, it's less declarative than you think in that whatever, like if you give it a Boolean, it's a conditional. If you give it an array, it's a loop. Like that's, and I, you can't look at the structure of the template and understand what it's really saying, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then second of all, like you maybe you want more things than like conditionals and loops. Like maybe you want more structure than that. Again, I didn't know about components at the time but sure. I think that's a good example of something where like you just need more things than initials and loops. Mm -hmm. And so the first piece of this is that I built handlebars JS um, that ended up being very popular. <clears throat> and it and like in part because I stuck to the, like try to still make it a non JavaScript centric thing. I used like lispy 
syntax and like mm -hmm. more like functions that makes it very usable in a lot of languages like any language with functions can use it instead of needing a very specific method like or proper like oh paradigm mm -hmm. so that ends up being useful so like there's a rust version that's very popular for example and like many other languages um so and i did that like originally i was like learning how compilers work like i didn't know i was like i i read this steve yege post that's like real programmers no compilers it's called rich programmer food but definitely recommend it um so i i saw this this post and i was like i really want to learn compilers but i have no idea how to do it i like kept reading the dragon book i'm like this is here be dragons no idea what's going on um, <laughs> and then i was like you know what i'll just like it seems like there's no good templating engine right now and even if i build like the stupidest possible templating engine like mustache JS is using regexes i should like the the simplest implementation like the newbie implementation should still be faster if i can figure out how to do it at all yeah right so mm -hmm. basically like i like the parser and the code generator in the first version are like in the same code and whatever but i did actually go like take the syntax and compile it into um javascript which just like it's not like the fastest thing the first version but it's much faster than mustache mm -hmm. and i also like this is also like a thing for me like i cared about mustache compatibility so like i basically pitched it as like, if you're using mustache, this is just a faster mustache. Also, now you can make your own control structures, which is like, sweet, pretty nice, right? Yeah. So, um, and it had stuff like partials, which eventually like iterated over time. But like, the point is, okay, so that's the first piece, right? The second piece is there was this uh, framework called Sprout Core, which I happen to already be aware of, because the person who made Sprout Core, um, Charles Jolly had used Merb, for weird reasons internally as like the build system of Sprout Core. And oh, so he was working at Apple. Um, I had given a tech talk at Apple at some point. And he was like, by the way, I'm quitting Apple and I'm making Sprout Core like really open source. And I'm like generally a believer in, in like permissive open source, not like I think that adopt, like getting things adopted, Matt, is way more important. I'm probably going to trigger some audience people here. <laughs> That's okay. I think, like trying to, I guess I'm not an authoritarian at heart. Like I think yeah. carrots are better than sticks and like, wide adoption works better as a way of getting what you want, like getting the values you want out there than trying to force people to only use your thing if they agree to your values. Like, so that was my opinion. I have a post about mm -hmm. this from like 10 years ago or something called like, it's like the maximal usage doctrine or some silly thing like that. Um, but basically I was like, okay, I am a true believer in the idea that that is a thing that you should do. And he, um, Charles was also committed to like making the whole system open source, including like, like open core was becoming a thing back then and he was like i'm not going to make the gui part of it closed source or whatever and that all appealed to me at the time and i was like hey i had this templating engine i think that the only thing i don't like about sprout core really at the time is that it's like very like you write a lot of javascript to describe html but like what if we just write html to describe html that seems right. better and like that's that was like we got together we start like he started a company called strobe that company lasted 18 months but the enduring legacy of that company is that somewhere along the way we were like okay the the history of this framework is just has a lot of first of all has users like a small amount but the users who care about the, the like it's like coco for the web thing which is <laughs> not what i was trying to do right um, but second of all it just has a lot of code in there to deal with it's like coco for the web and if what you're ultimately trying to do, which is what Ember ended up being, is make HTML the foundational thing, like the if you're like what is your if like people know one people know HTML, two mm -hmm. if you can write any HTML you want, then H, then you can also express any new like I, we don't have to think about how to incorporate it. It's just HTML, so you can like video tag just works, right? Like that's important. Mm -hmm. And so like basically Sprout Core two at the time was like okay, we're gonna rethink. Like a lot of the reactivity concepts still make sense, but we're going to rethink the whole thing to be based, like to get rid of all the stuff that's like, write this JavaScript blob and it will to like generate HTML, or, like do whatever things. Right, uh, right. And that by the time Sprout Core folded, um, uh, sorry, by the time Strobe got sold, it was sold to Facebook for parts basically. Okay. Yeah. Or the parts being the humans. Um, I like me and a few other people who worked at Strobe at the time didn't like never felt like working under the thumb of a big company. And so right. we started, like we decided to start our own company and we just exfiltrated again, like originally from Apple and then from Strobe, like the whole like Ember. And then at some point we were like, the fact that it's called Sprout Core is very confusing because 
it that has a meaning in the world there's like talks about it like blog posts we should just give it a new name because like sprout core 2 doesn't have a lot to do with sprout core 1 and so i think we called it amber and then there was like some small talk implementation and like people got mad and i made a post on hacker news that was just like it's a poll that was like should i call, is it okay for me to call it amber and like i actually a majority of people said yes but like 40 or something percent said no and i was like uh -huh. all right fine like i i'm not gonna like i'm not gonna stand on principle here i can just rename it again and someone in the comments was like what about ember and like that's what happened okay gotcha so basically ember how much of ember uh is the actual sprout core 2 implementation was there a lot of it was rewritten over time or i now almost nothing um mm -hmm. let's see so i think so in the interim like eventually i should talk about starbeam but in the yeah interim, we're gonna yeah, yeah. We will. Uh, i feel like i'm just i'm meandering as no i have two questions more and we're good <laughs> one uh, of them is about starbeam so we're good there the, yeah the thing about like so basically i think over time we tightened up like i think right before ember 1.0 like earlier on we were like we need a router i like gave a talk somewhere about the router and everyone was like this is a terrible ergonomics and i was like okay rethinking rethinking went back made a new router i think by the way like as much as i have a strong personality personally i am pr I, if somebody gives me a strong argument about why something i'm like not even an argument if someone just says hey i don't like it and here's like how i feel about it i'm usually gonna like stay up at night thinking about that like I just, it makes you refactor it in your head like there's something it, it, clearly like someone has an issue with the right I'm not, I'm not that defensive basically like, yeah like, that's I, good. I can end up being like like if someone asks raises superficial questions about like the primitives that i spend a lot of time thinking about that make that power level system then sure. yeah, i could probably be a little defensive about that uh, although i'll list like if someone gives me deeper like here's why the primitives didn't work that's fine but anyway sure. so Basically, that's like in the run up to 1.0, like the biggest thing was the router. Um, but like, I think like a few weeks before 1.0, I like landed an innocuous commit that was basically like uh, a component implementation, which was like five lines of code or something. And it just, it basically was like, we had this view system, which was based on Sprout Core. Mm -hmm. And the view system was like non-composable, right? It, it basically, it's like partials in like other backend frameworks where like the fact that you're calling it just splices it into where you are yeah right ways that make it hard to like break it out and like this is a standalone thing mm -hmm. and i was like what if i just say that the like internal state of this thing is a isolated thing i like figured out what the three things that are the internal state and i'm like let's just make a special version of you that is has these isolated aspects and i like may gave it a name called component i have i was not aware i think react technically existed but i wasn't aware of that yeah. um web components were like also kind of bubbling up as a conceptual thing but mm -hmm. basically at, at like at some point after like at basically views existed and they became like the spark or 10 way of doing things as an escape valve but like i was like after like going back to my rails history like i was really after making the internals composable because yeah. i could, i like so, and then when react made components a thing i was like okay i think i was right and I'm gonna like double down. So one of the major changes after like the original Sprout Core 2 changes, by now there's like nothing left of that view system. There's there were partials that were mm -hmm. from handlebars. There by now there's nothing left of that system. Those are all deprecated and removed by now. Um so like component centric design is really like replaced a lot of things. Um the other major part of Sprout Core that's still there, but Sprout Core 2 that's still there, but is on its way out is the reactivity system. And so like the reactivity system in Sprout Core and Sprout Core 2 was a push-based reactivity system, which it just means, it's like what people call signals these days, which right. basically means you have your your fundamental storage is just like a thing that you can think of it as an event emitter fundamentally, right? It's yeah. not really fundamentally storage, it's fundamentally an event emitter. Yeah. And that introduced like scheduling concerns, of, like we had observers, which like, a, for a long time ran synchronously because that's how Sprout Core did it. Right. And that, like, basically the ability to just reason about that system in a purely data flow way um, was not good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, in my view, like, kind of, like, you can put lipstick on it. And I think, like, in the in 2023, a lot of people have put a lot of lipstick on it. But at the end of the day, if the timing of when notifications happens is important, 
it makes it it makes you build systems that care about it. And yeah, right. So like basically Ember, like the most like the there was a edition of Ember called Octane. Um, by the way, like the fundamental principle of Ember has always been like uh, stability, like stability without stagnation was the slogan. But like the idea is that we are not leaving people behind. We are making new stuff and transitioning. So there's always like every new feature has uh, a transition period from the old one. So that's kind of, like I'm going to say in a minute, like why we still have this old thing. But Octane, which landed in like 2017 or something like that. Mm -hmm. actually created the new world which is the auto tracking system which is what became starbeam um and that like basically so the last part of spark core that i would say is like a significant piece of code which is the push-based reactivity system um in the octane period was refactored into a pull base it was refactored on top of glimmer which again became starbeam like so it was like the push-based system was refactored into a pull base system with the cost of if you are observing something synchronously, it's very expensive because like basically every time you set any property anywhere, we like iterate over anybody who cares. Not, mm -hmm. not that important, but like that's the that's the fundamental trade off is that yeah. like, we right. refactor it, but there's an actual reason that their systems are different. Um, and so in in Octane, we landed auto tracking and like the way you do things in modern Ember is you write at track decorator around the field that makes it a, a, a track thing. You, you don't need to um, enumerate your dependencies anymore. You can just use normal functions. All that's the thing that landed in like 2017. But like a lot of code, like 2017 is much after 2012. So a lot of code existed already that used the old system. So we focused on refactoring the old system to be, to be built on the new system. And only now in the Polaris edition, which is coming out in, I would guess like a year, um, only now are we going to like, really make sure that a like the internals of ember don't use any of the old system and b like it the tutorial and like the normal idiomatic way of using ember does not use it um and that even that is not removing it right so that like the ember phases are first we add the new thing we make sure the new thing is good then we stop using the old thing internally then we make sure that the that popular add-ons aren't using the thing then we update the tutorial and guides to not use the old thing anymore. So like if you're learning it for the first time, you won't encounter the old thing. And only after all that and everyone's like, and we wrote a migration guide, everyone's very comfortable that the new thing really covers all the cases. Only then do we remove it. So there's like going to, there's going to be a Polaris edition, which is really the point at which you could not use the old system anymore. Right. For like, for sure. And then right. 6.0 will come out after that. 6.0 will remove the old system probably, or maybe move it into an optional like package that you have to install. Right? So you so, can opt in for, your, you can upgrade your app, opt in slowly, make sure everything works. And then eventually two major releases pass that or whenever the right cutoff time is, yeah. that's when you have to worry about. So and that's, that is that's in good. general our major, that is our general our, our code evolution right. strategy. And it is why a framework that like M Skylight, which is the app I work on at Tilda, started out in pre ember 1.0 and today is using like a very recent version of ember and it's using typescript and auto track like and that reason for that is that we like not only do we build the future of ember we also like focus a lot on the migration and i i want i one thing to say about that philosophically which is that yeah i think people have a faulty imp i think i said this at ete like five years ago or something. i think people have a faulty impression that if you that that slows you down that if you take in, you already built the new thing, so why not just cut off the old thing? The problem is that all the old people still exist and they're still going to file, like purely from a time-saving perspective, yeah. they're still filing issues on your bug tracker. And like, you can see that this with Python 3, right? Like it, the Python 3 has existed as a, for a long time. People could have used it for like a decade or something, right? More than right. that. But the fact that people are still using Python 2 is a cost for the Python team. It's, I'm not just saying it's annoying. I'm saying... The Python team probably spent more time dealing with Python 2, 3 transition than they would have if they just did a correct transition path in the first place, right? And that I think that's like just a, that's a like a Yehuda law. Like, I just think that that's a mistake people make a lot. And so yeah. Ember just in general is just like, we build a new thing, which is what Starbeam is now. And we focus on making sure that the old thing is not just like chopped off again, because then we would have to just spend all this time dealing with people not using, wouldn't it be great if everyone was using the new thing? and not bothering us about the old thing, in order to make that happen, you have to help them. 
Yeah, because they're not going to suddenly be able to upgrade and everything doesn't work and they're going to stay with it. They're going to get none upset. Of us, none of us have magic yeah. ones. And like there's right. an ecosystem, right? There's add-ons. Like you have to coordinate things. And yes. like at the end of the day, that is what communities are for. It's like the reason it's not just pure code you can think about in your head is because there's a lot of decentralized parts working together that you need to coordinate upgrading. And if you just leave everyone to their own devices, there's no way it will happen. Yeah, I can I can think of like frameworks that have like completely shifted over the years. Angular JS to Angular, for example, yep. hugely crazy. Many people jumped off and said, "The heck with it! I'm going yep. with you know Ember or React or whatever else because of that." Yep. Um, you know, at, and, and at the, like at the time, Angular and Ember had a uh, Matt AC uh, interviewed us. Like uh -huh. our position at the time was you like both of us were in the same place. Angular was the Angular and Ember both started pretty or too early. And we reacted to come out and we need to figure out how to absorb those changes into our system. And mm -hmm. our position just at the time was we don't have to cut people off. You, you right. Migrate. And we, I think, I just think we were right. I think Yeah. it's not that Angular didn't survive. They, it's fine. Python also survived. Py, not only did it survive, Python is popular. So I'm not making a prediction that if you do the wrong thing, you will be unpopular. I'm making a prediction that you will cause a lot of pain. Yeah, it's the ergonomics again. We're, we're back to like, we'll make, and, we'll and just breaking. You know, breaking things that people have, making it hard to upgrade. Like you don't need to make people suffer, and it yeah. doesn't even save you any time. So right. anyway, I think we were right, and I think yeah. enough. Like now that ten years have gone by, I think you can see that we like people have different opinions. Like people can decide to troll Ember, but I think if you objectively look at the trajectory, I just think that like we're in the middle of landing a feature that it, like get, lets you write your templates in JavaScript. We're in the middle of adopting modern bundlers around the same time as everyone else is adopting ESM. Mm -hmm. Like it, I think at any given point, it could look like we're going slowly, but that's kind of a mirage because what's like, what's actually happening is that we are building the whole bridge, right? So like by the time the bridge is done, like every, the whole, everybody crosses it at the same time. Yeah. And everybody else is like, you are letting one car go, but like a lot of the cars are left on the other side of the bridge for a very long time. Yeah, and check out our new release with everything broken except these three new cool features. And and, and like I look you know. at our velocity as like did all like how fast did it take to get all the cars across the bridge? And mm -hmm. I just think Ember does well there, even though it like if you're only focused on one car, it looks like we're going very slowly. But mm -hmm. everyone else eventually has to get all the cars across anyway. Right. So like right. I think. Okay. So let's talk about just briefly because I don't want to completely take your talk and. <laughs> You know, talk about everything about Starbeam, but I would like to know. So, so Starbeam, as you said, it's the reactivity core, so to speak, of what you built up on Tilden Skylight through Ember. Yeah. Um, so, what is what is Starbeam for people who don't know anything about it? Yeah. So, I think I'm going to focus on like philosophical things because, or, or like how it came to be, just because my talk is going to be like what it is, how you use it. Yeah. Uh, perfect. So, That's great. So basically. At around the Octane period, which is like, again, 2016, 2017, we realized that the the stuff we got from Sprout Core wasn't going to work. Like, so React has a really awesome feature, which is that they can say that, how do you think about a component? You just, it's like a function you run once. And then if you want to update the function, you just like logically run it again. And like, mm -hmm. we'll take care of updating the DOM for you. Like, I, I think there are... Go watch any of Rich Harris's talks to understand like where some of the problems are. But yeah. I think at a first approximation and definitely like at when you start using React, that is a real benefit. And that benefit is just not possible if you use a push-based reactivity system, right? So like basically that benefit of you are not your own, like you are your, what is your, like what is a component? It's a function that like appears to run multiple times and how does it get its data? It just runs other functions. Like if there's some state somewhere that it wants access to, it just like calls it. And somehow <laughs> the consequence of that is that the DOM is always up to date. Again, I think the practical details of that both are like problematic, see Rich Harris, and also like ultimately result in a very, like getting, the, getting it, avoiding the problem that Rich points out require the hook system, which mm -hmm. is no longer the simple system that I described earlier, like requires you to think about all these details. That said, I think the concept of like, if you run this thing one time, it makes sense to you in your head, then you run it again, it makes sense to you in your head like that. And somehow it updates. I think that's, a, that's the best way to think about programming front end. That's declarative. And I think like Vue for, to its credit, while its internals work a little differently than 
I would like and has some consequences. I think it feels like that. And I think that's good. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think, so basically we realized that and I was like, okay, the problem is that our system is not even the good, like the modern signals thing that won't exist for 10 years or like five years or whatever. It's also just pretty bad in a lot of ways. Like you need to like write dependencies for whatever. And there was a system called knockout that existed like at the very beginning that eventually it turned like became the thing that inspired solid. I don't, I think the thing that is good about it as a system is that it proved out the concept of automatic dependency tracking. I don't think the knockout or solid implementation is what I want, but um, it does show you that you don't need like that you don't need manual dependency tracking and that just the normal process of acquiring data, like how do you get data? You read data. And the idea is that the normal process of reading data should be enough information to know what the dependencies of some computation are. And the result that means that if you want to know if you need to recompute the computation, you should ju you just check to see whether any of the things that you read changed. Like I, I think this is at a very high enough level. Of sure. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And so we like we want to build that. I think the main thing that made Ember do a different thing that eventually led to Starbeam is that at the time React was like this is really cool and it's great, but there's a little bit of a problem React says, which is that updates are slow. But it's not a big deal because like slow means like 50 milliseconds or something. And initial rendering is much faster because there's less bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like basically, even though like they would do benchmarks against Ember and be like, look, initial render is like 10 times faster. Admittedly, updating is slower, but that's fine, they would say. Um, and here's like the hand tuning thing you can do. Unfortunately for Ember, making our updating step slower like would have real implications that would make it impossible for us to make uh t like people wouldn't be able to migrate right like they would have apps that would suddenly be way too slow they were relying on the fact that updates are fast so the auto tracking system which is what became starbeam was basically an attempt to say like how do we get the benefits of making initial render fast by minimizing bookkeeping while also making updating nearly as fast like nearly as fast as it was before and basically like without going into too much detail the design is that um basically every like under data gets stored in in a piece of storage which we call a cell and mm -hmm. a cell is just like normal you just get its data by accessing a property on it but every time you access a property on it every time you write to it it updates a counter right so all it has to do is update a counter right so if you update like you have a, a person's name ken and you update it to like kenneth or something uh the property will go from uh, the, the internal counter will go from one to whatever the like to two right mm -hmm. and then whenever you read the a value in the context of some computation it just remembers hey i read a value i read this value and and it was at uh it was at it was to, it was at revision two so that whole computation has the revision of two mm -hmm. and then later on if you want to be like okay this, is this computation still valid all you got to do is say okay that's name cell like what is its current revision and if you change it in the meantime it will be five or something mm -hmm. and since the computation was last updated at two and the data that was used inside of it now has a revision of five that means the computation has to change and that so that is fully pull based there's no need to know like i'm hiding a detail here but there's no subscription here right because mm -hmm. you whenever you want to know do i need to update when this is computation invalid you can just check and now you might say, well, there's still like a work you have to do there, but the work of like checking a bunch of numbers and doing math is like nearly free in JavaScript compared to everything else we're doing. So the that basically the process of validating a computation is nearly free. And I don't mean like in the sense that React is like, you could just run all the user code and it's like much cheaper than DOM, which is true. This is like importantly different in that you don't have to run the user code at all if the computation mm -hmm. is still valid. Right. So this is basically giving you a validation channel, which is a pull based channel. Like it's a it's a value channel. You're you're getting there's a validator object and there's also a value. They both are something that you access when you want the value. But mm -hmm. before you bother to check the value, you can always validate it and get and use the old value. Right. So that's like that's the design internally. OK, um, the uh, uh, thing to take away like a thing to realize about that is that if you have a function that you that may has other functions side of it other functions side of it, other functions side of that the, the caching behavior that i described composes naturally right so if you have 
like if you have a function that like let's say you have name and age i'm not going to guess your age um and 300 you know, go ahead 300, <laughs> and you, like that function is going to like return a virtual dom or it's going to it's going to put something into the actual dom right mm -hmm. um if each of those function like if each if that function calls two other computations and each of, one of the computations updates the name and one of the computations updates the age the whole computation which is now like the app component invalidates whenever any of the like any of the children update which means that you can just be like hey is this is my whole app valid and if nothing inside of it invalidated then the whole app is still valid mm -hmm. and then but then if it if it is if it's invalid you it's still possible that like the name is still valid right so if the name is still valid that is valid and that cache like you do the validation on that piece don't do any more work move on to age that change you update that part right so basically that system is when I, nearly as fast as the push-based updating system, it still requires you to do a validation, but it never requires you to do run any user code, which is the which is really the thing that costs anything. Yeah, like it sure. never requires you to recompute the output if the inputs in change, and it lets you do that with imp, with automatically determining what the inputs of a computation are and in a composable nested way. Okay, so that like that's basically what we did in Octane. Mm -hmm. um, now that like. I'll, I'm getting to Starbeam in a second. Like basically, that system we built as Glimmer, Glimmer tracking, basically. Mm -hmm. And in like the Glimmer rendering engine is a thing that takes a handlebars template with Ember flavoring and turns it into a like a virtual set of byte of opcodes that knows how to intelligently render an update based on these concepts. Okay, and that all works great. And we've been like. Over time, we added more features. As I said, we now Ember now is, a, is has a feature which is landed but needs to be polished, which is like lets you write the template inside of your component, inside of the class body, right? Getting away from having two separate files. And all of that was possible to iterate on in terms of the Glimmer VM, which is the thing that renders, and the auto tracking system. However, and this is where Starbeam comes in, there are many use cases for this automatic tracking system that have nothing to do with this VM thing, which is like a big piece of machinery. Mm -hmm. And so at, at some point we were like, we started building Glimmer tracking and we were like, maybe we can extract Glimmer tracking into its own thing um, that p other people can use who are not Ember. But the more I looked at it, I realized two things. First of all, it just Glimmer tracking at, it would be difficult to iterate on Glimmer tracking to make it more generally applicable without constantly disrupting the way the interaction with the vm right so basically i could do it but then i'm forking it and mm -hmm. and at that uh, and the second point is second of all if i want to say that this is generally useful for people who are not ember i better like actually invest in making it generally useful for people who are not ember right yeah. so um the basically the idea behind starbeam is okay ember has a system it already works we don't even mess with it right now there's not even much to do there other than like maybe someday we should make it use the Starbeam system because like we shouldn't have to sit like it would be ridiculous if Starbeam was basically extracted as a conceptually from Glimmer then it became like a thing that everyone uses except Ember uses a different thing like yeah that. right <laughs> right so that's yeah. probably a thing we should do but in the meantime we don't need to disrupt everything because Glimmer is this like Glimmer is the proto implementation and it's like more or less the same thing right mm -hmm. so but then like what I mostly have invested, so Starbeam is like, let's extract, let's also like learn some lessons. Let's like rebuild, like we have an opportunity, like not rewrite, like it is a rewrite, but it's like, not like we're gonna rethink every possible concept, but like, it, like let's really take the opportunity to, it's like a Rails 3, right? Like mm -hmm. what are the primitives? Um, like what really, like if there's some cruft here, like why is it, like what's it doing? Mm -hmm. And so like, I would say about half the time was just like build up those primitives and like this week, I've been like doing another pass where I clean up the internals even more. Um, Cause some, like some of the contributors are like, this is so confusing internally. And I'm like, you are correct. We should make it. <laughs> um, That's but, okay. That so, happens, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's just like evolution of building things. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. So there's that, but I probably, but half the time that I spent at least, if not more has been um, fleshing out the concept of a renderer. So like, in Glimmer, there's like a there's no need to have a separate notion of render. It's just like Glimmer VM is it. Um, a renderer in Starbeam, and this act I have like one more point to make about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. I think I'm closing in on the end. Like a render in Starbeam is like you have a reactive value, 
and you would like to, you, like, you have internal reactive value, you have these computations, all that sounds very nice, but you also have an output, like, which is probably the DOM, mm -hmm. and you would really like the output to update as the input changes. Like, of course, that's the point of all this in the first place. Yeah. So you can kind of think of the output as a, like, a mat, like, let's imagine that th there was like, in just instead of just like, we have cells and formulas and there's resources, which I'll talk about in my talk. Um, imagine if we also had like reactive DOM, like in order, like in order to make that, of course that doesn't work. Right. But there's like a notion of, I, it's just another computation logically that should somehow stay up to date with the input. So a render is basically a thing that takes a reactive input and it's in charge of keeping some output up to date with, so that it looks like it's part of the same reactive system. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so that's like, like, that's what it is. And the point I wanted to make, and then I'll wrap up that this whole thing, which is a lot, every other reactive system has the concept of an effect, something like yep. that. Right. And they are usually very important. Mm -hmm. um, Starbeam, basically an effect, if you ask the solid guy is described as what I just said, it's a thing that takes a reactive input and does something with it, to keep it up to date. However, in what ends up happening with effects is that they are used in the inside of a system. You read from one piece of reactive state, whenever it changes, you write to some other piece of reactive state. Mm -hmm. And that could work if you have a big brain, but um, is just very, like, it's very confusing, causes cycles, and generally yeah. isn't like, doesn't feel like programming. Mm -hmm. Normal programming doesn't feel like, oh, I have some state, I'm reading it, and now I have new, I have a, a return value of a function. Like you could call it functional programming or whatever, but that's not that important, right? Like I think the point is like, you would really like it to be true that your computations are computations. They're not like code that sometimes runs and updates some other state, right? So effects in other systems are just frequently used as an all purpose escape valve to turn changes to some piece of state into changes to some other piece of state mm -hmm. without like a lot of thinking about what the consequences are, which is bad. Um, it's like the actual critique of two-way bindings, but now somehow it leaked back into everything. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Renderers are a special, like have a limitation, which is they are only, they're one way out, right? The, mm -hmm. Take a piece of state that's in the reactive system. It's a reactive value. And you are going to write to something that's outside the system. But that thing is not state that is also the input to some other part of the system, right? That thing is just an output, right? It's just a, like you have a DOM node. The div has a text field node inside of it. The text node is going to keep be kept up to date with the name property that we talked about before, the name cell. That div, that div is not also the input into other things, right? And like that, basically the render system, which I've been writing docs for and fleshing out and might touch on in my talk, um, that is basically a way of really restraining. Like you do need a way to custom, have a custom way of taking in a, a reactive value and and having something that's not inside of Starbeam look like it's being kept up to date, right? Like that, like otherwise, otherwise it's like one of these things, it's like Haskell without any IO, like it's like, okay, that's nice. But like now we're in math, we have not in reality. Right? So, like, you, <laughs> right. actually, you need it yeah. you need to have outputs, but um, Starbeam, I, like I'll say, speak for myself. I've worked very hard because this is one of the main lessons I learned from Glimmer through errors that to like say that, everything is data flow and everything can be modeled. And if we need to make ergonomic, if we need to help you think about how to model it by giving you good functions that look like how you think about fine, but the a render is a very special thing that only is only responsible for taking data that is reactive and turning and turning it into an up-to-date something that is not reactive outside of Starbeam system. It does not flow back the other way. And so, uh, I don't know why I started going down this path, except I'll, I'll try to figure it out. So, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so basically, it's good information too. It's just good yeah. background. Yeah. I think, I, okay. The, I think the point is like the Starbeam system, I guess I left out a thing, um, which I, <laughs> I think this is the, I think I said earlier and I'll, I'll I think this is the end of my meandering thought. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I said earlier, okay, so you don't have a push base system. Yeah, right. uh, you just have like whenever you decide to check if something is valid, then that's how like then you check and you know by checking the validation if it's valid or not, and you know if you have to recompute it. Okay, but I left out a detail, which is like, okay, how are you supposed to know that you're supposed to check? Right. Like it like basically there's a problem, like one, like you could just check it every 16 milliseconds or something, but like that seems 
not great. Um, and like, just to be clear, it's not even that bad in some sense, because if the thing is valid, all you're going to do is check the, like your, your application has dependencies on all the storage in the whole app, which is like maybe a hundred or a thousand cells. And all you're going to do is like, what is the current timestamp? 400. Uh, what is the max of all the timestamps of all the cells in the application? 398. Okay. That means, or 400. Okay. That nothing to do here. And that's the whole validation that you would have to do every 60 milliseconds. But like, especially when you're interacting with react or something like you're interacting with other systems, it, we don't have any way of like turning the whole app into one big computation. We have like a component is its own computation. So anyway, the point is that there is a way of saying, I am a renderer of this particular reactive value. And whenever the input changes, you need to tell me that that happened. And I will, I, and I'm going to do, I'm going to schedule the update to the output according to whatever makes sense. So in react, like in react to be very concrete, that means I'm going to take this reactive value, like this name property, and I'm going to return a virtual DOM. And whenever the, and I want every, anytime that name property changes, I want react to re-render me. And that, that's going to result in returning a new virtual DOM. Like that's yeah. what I mean by update. So in that case, the render, the react render, it's it, how it works is it subscribe, it subscribes to the reactive values that go into a particular component mm -hmm. and its job is to make sure that the output, which like the React virtual DOM is outside of the Starbeam system. Its job is to make sure that's up to date. Its job is not importantly to schedule that, like React knows how to schedule up rendering a component and you don't want to get in its way, right? Mm -hmm. Its job is not to update the actual DOM. React knows how to update the actual DOM. Its only job is to say, here is the, here is the reactive value that goes into this chunk of virtual DOM. And whenever it changes, I want to tell React, you need to re-render this thing, which it, like you do using the React hook, appropriate React hook. Mm -hmm. And when React bothers to re-render it, the key is it's going to just go and run the function again. And it's just going to, like, that's going to result in reading the reactive value because because that's like a reactive value is just a read of a normal mm -hmm. thing. And so that aligns perfectly, right? Like basically a Starbeam value, you, you read by reading it and you, uh, the React function, the React component is a function that returns a virtual DOM. Um, so the, all the renderer's job is, is to say, when here is the input into this virtual DOM, and whenever the input changes, React, please re-render, right, more or less. That's an example of a renderer, and it follows the rules because the React virtual DOM is not an input back in, it's not a reactive thing, it's not an input back into the system, right? So. Basically, render is like the advanced part of the system where you uh, are able to take, uh, you're able to take a reactive value and keep some external thing up to date. There's an internal experiment called vanilla render, which is just like updates our vanilla DOM. Um, but the here, here's the final, here's the capstone of this whole thing. Um, unlike every other system, more or less, where effect is just like a thing you need to learn as a beginner. Um, renderers like making a react render or a d3 render or a vanilla dom render or any of these things is a totally fine thing for an advanced person to do and then ship as a library it, and that is what should happen um obviously an advanced person inside a company is always free to do these things that this, there's nothing special about library but like the point is making a, a renderer is a advanced concept and that puts a lot of like the beginner concepts are just about data flow and so that like that whole thing is, I think that's maybe how to think about what is the point of Starbeam is to try to make that true. It's to try to make it true that you can think about everything you're doing as like normal JavaScript. That is just, you want to compute some value from some other values. The values happen to be reactive. You read them, their properties on some object, blah, blah, blah. Like looks normal. looks like, it looks like what we said we wanted from React, right? There's a function and it looks like it ran one time, but actually it runs many times, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, and the render is a re advanced topic, an advanced concept that is used to take reactive values that are the result of wh however many functions, however many intermediate computations and up and turn them into a piece of the output in your app. And that like, I, I've spent like probably 40% of all the time on Starbeam because React is very complicated has been the React renderer, um, but that's fine. Like some, I can, it's okay. Once I made the React renderer and now there is a React renderer and no React start, no React user using Starbeam 
has to think about renderers or effects again. That's that's really good, actually. So so instead of doing things and things like use effect, you can basically make things reactive with Starbeam, yep. and it will and plug the, in through the rendering process with, exactly, with your. Exactly. That's very cool. Okay. Right. So, so so basically, totally see the value there. Yeah. Slogans is like Starbeam is universal reactivity. I mm -hmm. think there's a piece that I didn't mention, which I will talk about in my talk a lot, which mm -hmm. is resources, which is basically, I didn't talk about like setup and cleanup. And uh -huh. that like the the slogan of it is it's just, it's the same, it works the same way as every other reactivity. I will show that in detail in my talk. But the, like the point is that adding setup and cleanup doesn't force you to use use effect, right? In React, adding setup and cleanup, you got to use where use effect comes up. Absolutely. That's right? exactly I mean, right. And even if you're, that, that's even true if you're writing a library, right? It only place where use like the equivalent of effects come up is in the renderer. Writing a re, like a resource is the name for the reactive value that could be cleaned up. You could write a resource that uses other resources that uses um, formulas is the name for reactive. Like however much you want, you can put those things in private fields. You can whatever. And the only person who has to care about the quote unquote effect is the renderer at the very edge. And like mm -hmm. that ends up being super valuable it ends up making universal reactivity possible and that's like basically that's the goal at the end of the day of starbeam is to take the reactivity system that made sense in ember and work for ember and make it universal but like but like everybody says that and then they're like look at my thing you could use it in react but you have to like the point of starbeam is to write the actual react renderer and the view renderer and the preact renderer instead of just being like as a thought experiment you could use view reactive in right yeah react. Like scene missing stuff. yeah right <laughs> like for all the rest of the owl it's like not mm -hmm. it's not false it's just that reactivity systems are elaborate like everybody's reactivity system is elaborate lots of edge cases yeah it turns out that there's enough in common to make renderers make sense but it's not it's like definitely a i have to be like at my most awake focused point to think about like the react one and right. that means that it doesn't make sense for like the person who's writing like use window size or whatever to be doing that like right. that's not good okay um, all right so so yeah so you're speaking at philly ete about starbeam and we'll definitely uh you know get a good idea of where you're going with it and where it is um and we're looking forward to seeing you at the show cool. awesome thank you so much Yehuda. really no appreciate it Great talking to you same all right see you there all right bye mm -hmm. bye okay thank you to Yehuda for that sorry to Yehuda for that uh that talk. There's a lot of really good information in there, and he gives excellent, excellent talks. Um, if you go back on our YouTube channel and search for you, Yehuda Katz, you'll see a lot of really great things. Even in 2015, he had a talk on Rust, and it was detailed and useful as hell. So, great guy to have speak, EDT. I'm glad he's coming back. Um, I'm going to play, I know this is going to end a little longer, but if you're here watching the live stream, we're going to play the next one as well. Rust Danner. Uh, is uh, a VP of product for, um, I'm sorry, is VP of product for uh, Crafter CMS. Uh, and he's going to talk at Philly Emerging Tech uh, about Omnichannel and how Crafter CMS and messaging systems or content systems uh, can, uh, can be part of that. So, and what we'll do, uh, if you can't make this, that's fine. We're going to split it up into two videos later. But I thought it was great to let you to talk and like really kind of get inside where he was going with Starbeam. So, um, okay, let's roll that clip. Uh, and again, uh, you can get a discount, uh, $25 off the live uh, streaming version of Philly Emerging Tech at phillyemergingtech.com. Uh, and you can use 25OFF, 250FF to save that. Uh, and again, phillyemergingtech.com for the tickets. All right. Becca, let's roll it. Emerging technology for the enterprise uh, coming up in, in April. Uh, and your talk is on Omnichannel. And I want to talk about that in a little bit. But first, I want to just kind of get a, an idea of your background for people who don't know you, since it'll be your first time speaking at our conference. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Well, I've been uh, in software for, for a long time now, uh, more than 20 years. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know the feeling. Basically started uh, started my professional career in process automation in a steel mill. And then around the dot-com boom, I thought, wow, this digital stuff is really exciting. And I really want to be part of it. And, um, you know, picked up my stuff, moved out of Pennsylvania, moved to, to Boston and got involved in the dot-com space and, uh, and in digital and been there ever since. So, um, and working with CMS is all along the way. I ran into CMS right, right away uh, in the early 2000s. 
I did notice that, that like all the way through your career, there's been that vein of working through CMS uh, solutions. So, you know, I did a, a very early on in my career, I shouldn't say that early, but maybe 10 years into my career, I dealt with a very, very manual CMS effort, which was, you know, clickable points on a website where we could attach content to it loaded from a database and things like that. And then obviously it moved on to more complex stuff. But um, you must have worked through regular uh, CMSs before ever getting to the headless era that we're in today, right? So if you were to discuss content management in terms of the way it's evolved from when you first started working with it to headless today, What's the main like you know changes that you've seen overall in your career at well, a high level? Yeah, real. It's real interesting because you know it's it's. I think a bigger pattern in in so in software and technology period is always that you have a certain set of circumstances and it drives architecture in one direction, and then the technology changes and the architecture swings, and then later you see things start to swing back the other way, and you get like a yeah antisynthesis and, and a thesis. So, um, so, you know, I would say re really early on the, the focus was on the content authors and making it easier for them to manage their web pages in a non-technical way. And, uh, and then as more and more channels came online and the speed of development uh, came up, you saw a real demand on, on the developers saying, Hey, you know, we, the business people want to get a lot of things done. Uh, and we're not able to get them done because you guys are slow in implementing things in the CMS. The developers sort of said, well, you know, the CMS is a pain in our butts. And uh, so if, if this thing could be more like an API, we've been really successful with, uh, with API-based architectures and, uh, and, and REST and, and REST-related architectures. Let's go in that direction. So they did. And then I think... And that's where you, that's headless, okay? Mm -hmm. well, we're actually way beyond that now. You see a real uh, push from, from content authors saying, okay, great, now you guys are churning out new experiences for us quicker, but the editing experience is not great for us. So now we start to see a swing back towards the authors. So there's, there's always this broader sort of pattern that you see in the tech space. So did Crafter, uh, was it originally created as an API-based uh, CMS? Like how did it uh, start in 2012, 2013? Yeah, always, we've always had an API-first approach. Um, just really fortunate to not be in that very, very early set of CMSs, uh, which were, you know, monolithic mm -hmm. uh, APIs and REST and things were well-established by the time we started. So we had we had that, um, the, the benefit of that. So we've always had... APIs first, and we've also always had server-side rendering, and we actually think there's an important, you know, piece where it's not everything is, and you know, not everything should be a client-side app, uh, not everything should be uh, API-driven. So we, the platform actually supports a really wide range of, of approaches so that you can sort of pick the thing that makes sense for you. So when you say uh, you've got server-side render rendering, so uh, that means like if your output form is HTML, you automatically render stuff that can be slapped into a div or what have you, or a content area on a pane. And if it's, uh, you're exporting JSON, you can turn it into a JSON document. Like, is that the kind of thing uh, that you, you deal with in terms of content driven content format types? Yeah, I would say at the heart of it, yes. Um, uh, I guess really the distinction here is, you know, in, in uh, let's say a lot of headless CMSs today, if you're gonna server side render, it means that you're gonna put Node.js in front of mm. your CMS or something. I think Crafter obviously works with that and, and works great with that, but we also have like native server-side rendering capabilities and, and templating built right onto the platform as well. So you don't need any other technology. Gotcha. Okay. So all, all in one kind of thing. Yeah. Um, all right. So then uh, also the, the big push lately has been like trying to treating it as Git repository or using Git type commands to, to publish and, commit things. So tell me a little bit about how that evolved for you guys. Yeah. So I, well, first, I mean, Git's big, become really big in, in DevOps. And again, yeah. I think that the content space um, really around a lot of the CMSs that focus on Markdown um, really thought, well, Hey, you know, we, we need to get this, these Markdown uh, objects uh, processed and then get the output at HTML out to the, you know, to our delivery tier, whether that's S3 or whatever. Let's let's use Git to do that because DevOps and, uh, has been really, uh, really 
has really done well for people. So let's go and use that. And so that's where you see a lot of Git-based CMSs. But Crafter, we actually, we go even further. So we, one, we recognize that uh, the versioning capabilities of Git are amazing, right? Like, so mm -hmm. basically a time machine-like versioning, that's awesome. Then you look at uh, uh, th things like branching, okay? And branching is awesome for developers. It allows you to do all kinds of things in parallel. It allows you to handle uh, you know, segregation of, of code that shouldn't be yet in the main line of, of, of uh, code and, and, and work on things in parallel. Well, well, if you think about it, content authors want the same kind of thing. You know, yeah. they redesigns. They have uh, uh, content that they can't share with other uh, people yet and things like that. So, um, so branching really works well for them. What doesn't work well is the Git mechanics, the actual Git commands. So you got to yeah. hide that from them. So or very early on at Crafter, we recognized that, hey, um, you know, yeah, Git's a, Git and DevOps is a great way to get stuff out the door, but it's actually Git uh, and not Git-like functionality, but Git functionality that we want to put in the CMS as the versioning system to support branching, to support a bunch of other operations, which we now call Dev Content Ops, which is really this ability to move uh, content between environments and uh, development work between environments to get that published and support like the whole team as equal citizens. And we hide Git. I mean, for the authors, yeah. the idea they're pointing and clicking and doing whatever they want and Git's in the background doing its magic. I can't imagine a content author figuring out a Git bisector. Right? No, no. <laughs> Help <It> stop. <laughs> but that's great. So, so, and how long ago did you integrate Git with your uh, APIs? Was it early on or? Uh, or well, I would say about around 20, 2016, 2015, mm -hmm. 2016. We were so relatively at... early in the process. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, um, I was looking at like now you're supporting GraphQL, for example, mm -hmm. in addition to REST, right? So tell me a bit about like how your users are using GraphQL today. Like what kinds of things can you do with GraphQL with your product instead of just flat REST APIs? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And I think, I mean, and I see a lot of adoption of GraphQL in general in the open source community. So Crafter, no exception to that. Um, I, th I think uh, we see GraphQL as a big enabler of integration uh, scenarios. So where organizations already have APIs and they want to bring a bunch of APIs together, GraphQL is a great way to do that. If you want to bring content to say like a product, so you've got you know, if you think about a product, the merchandising process, you've got the the actual product SKUs and the basic details of the product, and then you've got marketing content. And the audiences or the, the users that manage those two things, very different people. Yeah. But at the end, what matters to the use cases is that combined set of data. So GraphQL is this awesome technology where you can take those two independent systems uh, and integrate them in a, in a common interface uh, through GraphQL. So we see a lot of that. And I actually think in general for content management, GraphQL is like this amazing thing because CMS space has been looking for some kind of API standard forever. And because we're not uh, like a huge market, I mean, everybody's got some form of content management, but basically every standard that's been like, I'm gonna make a content management standard, <laughs> not been successful. Right. Because mm -hmm. developers like the wide range of developers. So uh, when I say we're not a huge market, I mean, think about uh, the market for React or the, yeah. you know, the amount of, of developers that get to know React. OK, everybody. Right. Or mm -hmm. Angular or Vue. Everybody gets to know that stuff. But then the market of people that learn CMS specific stuff, just much smaller. OK, yeah. so I love the fact that GraphQL is here, uh, that everybody wants to know that technology gets to learn it. Um, and then it just applies to a, a more niche technology or a niche domain like CMS. I remember years ago, uh, there was Apache, was it Slide? Many, many years ago was one of the APIs that was HTTP based and very buggy. Uh, and then people were trying to do like REST as an API, but it's so low level and so many calls to get anything done. Uh, yeah. And GraphQL and, um, is nice that way, you know? Yeah, you had, you had IECM, you have CMIS, you have, uh, you know, the, the JCR, which was content yep. management and then Java specific. So it, none of that stuff is going to None of it works. No, I, it was all too complex or too clunky or, but GraphQL is basically kind of like a new, 
you know, definable schemas, definable uh, queries. And, you know, obviously you have to do the legwork to integrate things. Yeah. Which, and which the key kind there of is to make sure it is performant. Like that. Oh, yeah. What we see is you could take uh, something um, like Apollo and slap it in front mm-hmm. of any system and make it a GraphQL based system. That doesn't guarantee it's going to be fast. So, yeah. What are you well, doing between GraphQL and the APIs and yes, that's not key. throttling it to death with tons of calls, right? Yeah. Right. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. So speaking of all that stuff, uh, you have a marketplace, right? So I assume you have developers putting in like plugins and integrations of various systems and various types of uh, environments. How do you manage a marketplace as a product developer? Like what what goes into that for you? So, I mean, the first piece is uh, we're we're open source. So uh, I think, you know, basically getting uh, adoption for the marketplace or getting people to put things in the marketplace uh, is easier for us because we have an open s- source like foundation, a base for for mm-hmm. developers. So it's it's not a you know here's our little tiny API and stick to that. People can get in and kind of understand what we're doing and build on top of that. Mm-hmm. So that that's the first part is being sort of transparent or having a transparent uh, you know set of a uh, framework and things that people can build on. And a community that people can go to and ask questions like a Slack or a Stack Overflow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think beyond that, it's just about making it easy. Well, we, one of the things we try to do is make it really easy to get your plugin listed in our marketplace. So we have a GitHub plugin and you install, you, you know, you build your project and then you install our plugin into your GitHub project. And every time you tag that project, it sends us a note and says, hey, this, this, this plugin's updated. Would you like to you know, update the listing in the marketplace and we can then go in and take a look and make sure there's no malware in there and say, okay, that's good. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing, like you're dealing with open source and you're dealing with lots of open source libraries. You're based on like what Groovy and Java and things like that. Is that your, your, your core uh, system? The the foundation foundation of software is, is Java and Mm -hmm. Spring and Groovy, but uh, as a headless system, it doesn't really matter what what technology you you write in but yeah if you're going to get in and modify the core it's going to be with with java and spring and groovy yeah i mean i i guess you know i've been doing so much work lately with like node.js based things and like (laughs) the npm marketplace is like crazy all the time Mm -hmm. so many changes so many things things going away sunsetting at least when you're dealing with like maven central and things like that it's a little more stable and calm environment to work with so but i'm assuming you've had to deal with various open source library issues and things like that in the past, right? Like how do you resolve those kinds of problems? Like yeah, log think, for your shell and things like that. Yeah, I think that's common. Um, yeah. And and you're not gonna get away from it. I mean, and by the way, we, we sort of live in the the Node.js community as well because we mm-hmm. have native node bindings that we just have to, we live there as well. But, right. but uh, I would say that, that, you know, handling, you know, vulnerabilities and things like that, that's common. We have a standard practice you know, and, and policy and process for that outlined on our, our docs. And we are a CNA with MITRE. Uh, so we actually participate in that process of, okay, great. We, you know, we found out about something. Let's, let's work to, uh, to make it public in a, and disclose it publicly in a, in, cool. a, in a responsible way. And that's when we, when people find issues with Crafter, we've had great, uh, that's one of the great benefits of being open source. We have great uh intelligence coming in from from white hat individuals and so on um but then you know just dealing with the um with other dependencies well i mean that's just part of our everyday build process and i think that's just common to everybody now every time you build you get a dependency report and it says okay these 20 jars need to be updated and we you know go ah all right let's do it (laughs) everyone has a certain level of pain right (laughs) it's you know and and again i mean just I, I mentioned, you know, 20 years. I mean, I was part of the DLL hell. You know, I remember oh God, yeah. software <laughs> onto a machine and then going, why why doesn't this thing work here? Mm-hmm. Uh, be, you know, because some library that it depends on isn't there or some version of the library doesn't depend. So th- so now you have dependency management and so on. And so, you, you know, for the old guys, we know, like, this is not an easy problem and there's no, uh, you know, there's going to be pain somewhere. Sure, sure. All right. Um, let's see here. So you're t- on the channel talk. So let's, I don't want to delve too deep into it because obviously you're going to get to talk there, mm-hmm. but just at, at a high level, um, if my, underst- 
and my understanding is about this deep in omnichannel personally, but if, if it's that you want to engage in a customer wherever they are, whether it's you're chatting back and forth with them on a chat, then you want to offer them a discount and email, or you go to support and they can pull up all your information, or they notice you search for something. How does um, Crafter CMS and how do you look at your role in an omnichannel uh, yeah. platform? Well, and, and I, I'll, you know, I'll kind of maybe get into a little bit how I'm going to tilt this uh, talk. Sure. Uh, but in, let me just answer that question. So I think mm -hmm. the first part is, and this is where headless shines the most, right? Is by being headless, we, you can plug into any, uh, you know, any device, any kind of, and or any kind of experience technology. So it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, it's a React app or a native mobile app or a Alexa skill or, you know, which would be completely, obviously completely headless or AR, VR. I mean, there's just so much. Uh, and so I think being headless is maybe the the table stakes for that. Um, and then going beyond that, I think making it easy to compose those experiences is the next big piece of it. Uh, when I mean author the content for it, because mm -hmm. uh, if you're just headless, but you say to your authors, okay, well, I want you to make this uh, content that's going to go into this game console, but you're basically going to work in a spreadsheet and you're going to write these strings out. Okay, so that just takes these authors from a world where they're used to using um, really rich CMSs to modify their website and then saying, okay, but now you live back in 1997 with <laughs> and you're going to modify. a great editor known as the input box on Excel. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's the next phase. And then I think beyond yeah. that you go, okay, now um, people are trying, starting to solve this with really, with more robust editing features for headless CMSs. So certainly Crafter, we, we started that a long time ago. And then I think there's another wave coming, okay? Uh, and that's actually where I want to go with my talk because I think the the whole uh, digital space suffers from, uh, you know, this sort of tyranny of scale or or maybe the scale is not the right word, but I'll use the word more, the tyranny of more, um, you know, more channels and devices constantly coming up. Uh, there's more types of content that we, you know, we get into every day or the things that go from being like really expensive to becoming really cheap and interesting to do. So it used to be that video was like super expensive. If you wanted right. to do live video, you know, get out your wallet. Now it's cheap. So everybody wants to do it. And it's an awesome medium. Here we are doing it. Uh, so that's like the sure. types of content that show up all the time. Then you have types of experiences and personalization is something people have wanted to do since the early 2000s. But then you have so much content you got to write. So there's more content. So it's like more, more channels, more experiences, more content more demand for development, uh, there's more traffic and more security issues, which you brought up. And and really under the hood, there's more technical complexity. So there's all this more. So it's like the tyranny yeah. of more, right? And um, and basically what I'd like to do with this talk is kind of point some of these things out and then talk about what has come along, what the, the upside of more, which is, you know, uh, better better uh, technology to, to deal with this stuff, better processes to deal with it, how we can deal with it, um, and 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 really show how open source and headless can help with that and how that transitions to mock architecture and how that can help. And then the next wave, which is low code and no code and AI, uh, which I think, and composability, yeah. right? Composability, which is gonna help address a lot of this. So. That's that's kind of the the arc of the talk. We'll you know uh, hopefully people will find that interesting. I was just thinking about um, OpenAI and ChatGPT and things like that, just because everyone is right now going, well, how is this going to change everything? Which I think it's probably massively changing some things and not other things like your typical, you know, new crazy technologies. But I'm assuming that if you've got the ability to, just like you're you're doing elastic search with it, right? You're mm -hmm ability to like crawl your CMSs with a private chat GPT instance to be able to ask questions of it and make a knowledge base out of your content. That's gotta be huge for your, your customers, right? I mean, are you, do you have people doing that now in various yeah. uh, customer settings? Yeah, I uh, certainly in terms of like chat bots and, and knowledge mm -hmm. bases, I think what we're starting to see now too is, hey, I have all these articles, can you can you translate, you know, can you take those and make those into videos? So repurposing mm. content. I think this is another big thing that that um, you're really gonna see. Like, so you're not gonna take away the creative process. 
And uh, from I used to work at a newspaper, right? So mm -hmm. are we going to give up gathering news and writing uh, writing news? No. Uh, right. You know, we might have an AI uh, generate some sort of like very factual things, but the op-ed stuff is not going to go away. We value human insight, human opinion, so we we want to bring that in. So I don't think that that's going to go away, but but I think that you know saying hey that's a great op-ed turn that into a video and get that online right. that's something that uh you know a ai can do very quickly and get something online and then it's only the really high value stuff that you might say hey okay great but let's let's have janet you know build a really uh specific thing for this this one story that we have another thing i think is going to happen is um you know uh this the whole idea that i talked about personalization so it's it's always been a challenge uh, once you get into personalization to, to actually create all the content. So everybody's like, oh yeah, I want to write all these, oh, movies, yeah. all these personal experiences. And sure. then when they find out they need a bigger team to do that, they go, oh, never mind, <laughs> right? So yeah. if you can say to the, uh, if you can say to the AI, the chat GPT, if you can say, hey, here's my content. It's written, you know, without the audience in mind. And now I'm going to tell you about the audience. Uh, it's it's students or it's um, you know it's it's older older folks or or whatever parents. Uh, now write this content, uh, rewrite this content for them. Okay, great. Now I've got some efficiency there, and then mm -hmm. I can say, okay, now um, in addition to that, watch what they do on the website and keep improving your output on that stuff until this stuff works. Now you've got something in the targeting space, and I think that's again that's where we're going to see some real value in content management, or, you know, in AI. Well, also you get to see all the changes that go through. So you see the evolution of things. And if you can make that available to it, it can see the evolution of things as well. Right. Um, and it can make inferences based on that, which is really interesting. So yeah, they're not just seeing the content, they're seeing the evolution of the content, which is really fascinating actually. Cool. All right. Well, that sounds great. So uh, let, let's do another couple, just a couple quick questions about Crafter itself. So Crafter is an open source project, as you said, and there's commercial support and commercial uh, licensing for it as well. Um, if someone wants to experiment with it, I think I was able to just download it and install it as a, a experimental developer to check it out, right? There's, there's kind of a free mode and then there's the commercial mode. Where does that yeah, kind so of break? I mean, we have a couple, we, I mean, we try to make this as easy as possible. Yeah. You've got uh, downloads from the site, you've got Docker images and Docker hub. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you go to craftercms.com, we have a try button. So you just go there and we'll actually spin up an environment for you uh, and mm -hmm. keep it online. It's a trial environment. So whatever works for you. And if you're looking for help uh, with something that you're trying to run, you know, you can hit us on Slack and we'll, we'll try to help you get up and running. Cool. Russ Danner is going speaking about Omnichannel. Uh, your title of your talk here uh, is Conquering the Challenges of Building and Deploying Omnichannel Digital Experiences at Scale. And we look forward to seeing you at ET. Oh, thanks so much, Ken. Thank you, Russ. Take care.